Okay, so we have our server up and running. On the server, I have a default Laravel application, and it has some scaffolding set up for user login and registration. If I head on over here to the server itself, I need to run a migrate command in order to migrate stuff into a database. But of course, I don't have a database set up. So what I want to do in this video is create a database using Amazon's RDS service. So I'll head on over to RDS, the managed relational database service. And we can see I have no DB instances here, but I can go ahead and click into this and we can create one. Now we want to decide what kind of database to make. I'll do the standard create process instead of easy. I'm going to do MySQL, although you can also do Aurora, which has a MySQL and a Postgre flavor, but I'll do MySQL for now. You can investigate differences here. Aurora has some interesting differences in that it has higher throughput for very rate heavy databases, but there's a lot of other things going on there too. But for the most part, it's kind of transparent if you decide to use the MySQL flavor of Aurora. Okay, so I'm going to do MySQL 8. I'll do the latest version of 8 they provide. Do 6 in this case. I'm going to say it's for production, but We'll give this an identifier. I'll call it onboarding AWS, a master username. So for example, root is the usual one you get from MySQL. I'll keep using admin and I can have it auto generate a password or set one for myself. And I just have a 24 character one that I've just generated myself there. And here we select the instance class sizes. So we have standard memory optimized and burstable. Burstable are the cheapest ones, just like with EC2 servers. So you have T3 available here and T4G, T4G, are Graviton. So G is for Graviton. And what that is in AWS are the ARM CPU based instances versus the X64 T3s. X64 is like the Intel chips, basically. I'll typically have people start with a T3 or T4 instance, and you can make your database bigger from there. These have the CPU credit burst system. So you have to monitor your CPU usage and make sure you don't run out of CPU credits for your database, which is super important. Otherwise, you can move on up to the standard ones, which are just kind of general purpose CPUs. We have the G here again, so that's ARM-based instances, and they also have the other uh, types, the Intel-based CPUs. I mentioned ARM-based CPUs because they're newer as of this video, relatively new. They are cheaper, and their performance is just as good or better based on what I've heard. So I actually suggest using the Graviton, the ARM-based instances here. I'm going to select the Burstable class. There is also the memory optimized, which means you get more RAM per instance type, the R class. So burstable is what I'll use. I'm going to do the T4G to get some cost savings on the CPU versus instance types. Here it's Graviton, uh, so it's an ARM-based CPU. It'll be a little bit cheaper, and the performance hopefully is just as good or better than regular Intel CPUs. So I'll pick this two CPUs and two gig RAM for the T4G small, and then we can move on to storage. Okay, so GP2 is the one that most people use here. You can use IO, but uh, I'm not going to get into the details there yet. You pay more for IO instances. GPU is general purpose. Note that there's no GP3 here. There's only GP2. For GP2 instances, your IOPS, the number of operations per second you get, goes up with your storage. So it's very common to increase your storage, your number of gigabytes here in your database, just to get a higher level of IOPS available to you. So you might want to do something like a terabyte, a thousand gigabytes to get 3000 IOPS, for example, because you get three IOPS per gigabyte of storage allocated with a minimum of 100 IOPS. So I'll do 500 gigabytes, which will give me 1500 IOPS, which is an okay number. Now remember the trade-off you're making there is that you pay per gigabyte per month. And here I'm getting a minimum of 1500 IOPS and these, this disk will be able to burst up to 3000 IOPS. That's a credit system as well. So it's possible to use up your burst credits for IOPS as well on a heavily used database. Autoscaling, uh, enable storage autoscaling. This will increase up to a thousand gigabytes uh, if you need the disk space automatically for you. This is a pretty good option, but note that you cannot scale down. Once you have provisioned some storage, there's no going back. So you can't go up to a thousand gigabytes, then go back down to 500. Multi AZ. So multi AZ is interesting. I'm not going to create one in my case here. Instead of putting your database instance into one availability zone, and remember we're in USCs 2 where there's three availability zones. Instead of putting your database just in one, it'll put your database in two availability zones, and one will be active and one will be on standby. A multi-AZ setup will fail over to the standby one in the certain cases. One, if there's an error in the instance that's being actively used. Two, during routine maintenance, when it's doing minor version updates, for example. And three, during its nightly 
automated backup, the snapshot of your database. So if you use a multi-AZ setup, it is going to fail over for that often, you know, mostly because of those backups that are made once a day. Now, multi-AZ setup are two different instances, and so your cost for this database literally doubles for the compute, not for the storage and all that good stuff, but just for the uh, database instance itself. So your cost is double, but you get a lot of uh, backup and you get to sleep at night. So that's a trade-off you have to decide on to make. So in this case, I'm not going to create a multi-AZ instance, but if for a production use, you might want to heavily consider that. I only have one VPC in my account. As I mentioned, when we were making our EC2 server, I'm going to select the default VPC, the subnet group. So this is going to decide what subnet your server is going to be put in and therefore what availability zone. We just have this option of default, so we're going to keep it here because we haven't made any additional subnet groups. Over here, if I select this and create a subnet group, we can see what that allows us to do. So I can create a DB subnet group if I wanted to. What it does is have you create a uh, thing that defines what subnets and availability zones your instances can be inside of. So my default VPC, I could say maybe I'm allowed to create servers in these two uh, availability zones, or maybe just one. Now, the key here is that you actually have to have at least two subnets selected to make a group for instances that use the multi az setup. You can't create a subnet group that has just one. So I'm actually going to skip this altogether and just use the default subnet group, and RDS will just decide what availability zone and subnet to put the RDS instance in for me. I don't want public access in my case because I want it to communicate over the private network only. Security groups. I don't have any security groups specific to uh, a database, right? So I'm actually going to create a new one. Now, security groups are needed here the same way they are needed for EC2 servers. By default, no access is allowed at all. So I need to create a security group to allow access over port 3306, which is what MySQL communicates over. So I'm going to call this MySQL internal SG for security group. This is going to create a security group for me. And it looks like it's actually just going to go ahead and set the settings it needs there for me without me needing to do any other action. Availability zone, I have no preference between this. I guess I'm going to prefer 2C because my server is in 2C as well, and that might reduce uh, bandwidth costs if the database is not in the same availability zone as the server, because there is an extra charge for bandwidth when it moves data across availability zones. Port 3306, I'm going to leave that as the default port is being run. Password authentication will keep default, but it'll use the password I set for that user admin above and the rest I'm going to keep by default. Now it tells me what the estimated monthly cost will be, right? So the DB instance is 23 bucks, the storage of 500 gigabytes is 57 a month, the total is 80. If I did a multi-AZ setup, this would double to uh, 46 and change per month, and the storage does not double with that. So let's create this database. Creating an RDS database takes a few minutes, so we're going to have to wait for that to finish, and then we can see how to use it. Okay, so we have created our instance. It is available. Let's go ahead and go in and explore this a little bit. We'll have a little bit more work to do still. So we have an endpoint here. The endpoint is what you want to always use to connect to the database, even if you have a public or private database. This is the DNS endpoint to use, whether you're internal or external to uh, AWS's private networks. We can see it's in the VPC we selected. This one happened to be created in USC's 2C, which we set as our preference. It actually is allowed to create itself in any of the three subnets that we have inside of this VPC, which means it could have ended up in any availability zone. This is the default subnet group that we use there. It's using the default one, which just allows it to potentially get created and fail over into any of the subnets if we had that multi-AZ setup. It's set up for this security group. We'll visit that in a second. That's the one we called MySQL internal SG and that it created for us. And the security group rule uh, we can see here has some funkiness. This is actually my IP address of my home network. So it's actually only allowing inbound traffic from my home network, which is wrong. That's not what we want. So we'll have to fix that in a bit. We don't have any replication set up or proxies or anything like that. Let's go ahead and set this endpoint into our application here. So we'll edit the .env file, the connection for DB host. We're going to set that. The database, um, we'll call it Laravel. There's no database created in there just yet. The username is admin. The password was this string. Now we don't have a MySQL command here, so I'll go ahead and do sudo apt get install dash y MySQL client to get that MySQL command. And we can see it's installing MySQL client uh, 8.0, so it's going to be compatible with our 8.0 version of a database here. And we can do MySQL dash h dash u admin dash p, or the password I have in my clipboard. Let's fill out that host name, which is that long one here. And the password is this. 
Okay, notice what's happening here. This is timing out. So I'm actually not able to connect to it from my private network. So over here for that security group, we'll see it created a security group for us, but it wrongly decided to only allow traffic in from um, my IP address, the IP address that it sees of me connecting to AWS here, the, the IP address of my home network, which is dumb. That might make sense if you set the RDS instance to be public, but I set mine to be private. So let's go ahead and edit the inbound rules here. And I want a different IP address range here. I don't want anywhere. Even though this is only created and hooked up to my private network, anywhere is still a security hole. I want a custom one, and I want it to only be allowed to come from the IP address range of my private network. So let's head over to VPC real quick. We're still in Ohio, so we only have one VPC there, the default one, and that has this IP address range. So I'm going to copy and paste that, head back into here, and set that as the IP address range that it's allowed to use for connections. So we'll save the rule here. Um, we're back in EC2, so let's go to RDS. And back in our instance, we can see our security group should have changed, so the rule is to allow traffic from our private network. So let's head back here. This is still timing out. Let's try that again. And now we've connected. Great. So show databases. And I have an extra character there, so the syntax error is there. I don't have any databases, so we can say create database Laravel. And the default character set to use is UTF-8 MP4. So I have a database named Laravel. I'm not going to make another user or, any, or do any of the extra MySQL security stuff here. I think that'll make this work now. So I should be able to do PHP Artisan migrate. And it worked. So I can connect to the database now. Over here in the application, I should be able to register as well. And I'm able to register. So a record was created on that database, the users table in the database as well. So we have our database hooked up to our application. There's logs here, and you can enable other logs like your slow logs. Those are disabled by default. Configuration just is the configuration that we made when we created this database. There's not much to be said here just yet. Maintenance and backups, you can set a maintenance window of when this will do uh, automatic updates for you for automatic minor updates and other kinds of maintenance. OK, so we have a database up and running. I think the one thing I really want to hammer home about making databases is that typically you set it so it's not publicly available, especially if your server is an EC2 server in the same private network. If you put it in the same VPC as a server, it can be in any availability zone inside of that same VPC. As long as it's in the same VPC as your EC2 servers, then they can communicate over the private network, no matter what availability zone or subnet they are in. RDS databases typically want to be in multiple subnets, potentially because if you have that multi-AZ feature, then this database can fail over to a different server in another availability zone. It's always a different availability zone because that's a higher availability setup. If one availability zone has issues, it can fail over to a database instance in another availability zone. Again, if you create through the console instead of through the API or through a tool like Terraform, it can create a security group for you, but you need to be careful that that security group actually has the inbound rules that you want. In my case, I set it to allow inbound traffic if the source is within the IP address range of our private network. 